I am Francis McGee. I am a graduate student from McGill. I'm working in the lab of Dr. Cynthia Chang on early universe cosmology, experimental early universe cosmology. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about our antennas, our system, how we're using more conventional radio stuff and how we want GNU radio to be involved in our system later. So my work that I've been doing has been alongside a pair of undergrads, Michael Haytu and Vlad Kalinescu, who played a big role in this, so I want to shout them out at the beginning. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of where our antennas fit in kind of the grand scheme of the universe. So as you probably know, early on there was the Big Bang, and then after the Big Bang, there was a lot of ionized matter that then recombined into kind of a neutral matter, which doesn't give off a lot of light. And then we had re an era of reionization that gave off a lot of light. And then we have the galaxies, which give off a huge amount of light and get in the way of all of the measurements of that stuff before. So our system is set up to measure two different parts. We've got two different antennas that are measuring two different parts. We collaborate with a lot of groups, but these are the kind of the two ones that are under active development that I've been working on. There's the albatross antenna and the mist antenna. And the albatross antenna is mainly used to probe the cosmic dark age, and the mist antenna probes a little bit more kind of around cosmic dawn when the first stars are starting to appear and reionization is beginning, and, and probing a little bit of the dark age, but not so much. Now, with the, the dark age, the dark age was dark and it didn't give off a lot of the kinds of light that we would use to probe other periods of time. So there was a specific hydrogen transition called the 21 centimeter line, which gives off a, a distinctive 21 centimeter wavelength line, which is then redshifted as the universe expands. And by measuring this at various kind of modern wavelengths, we can see how intense that line was over at the universe in previous time periods. So we're looking very much at that early part here, the very early part, and all this stuff in the middle is kind of getting in the way. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the early albatross antennas. So this is our kind of the, the the base antenna that we use here. This is set up just kind of in a, a remote location. These albatross stands for array of long baseline antennas for taking radio observations from the 79th parallel. That last word has changed a few times, but right now it's 79th parallel. And this is, as I said earlier, a probe into the cosmic dark age, which happens at a wavelength that's interfered with heavily by modern civilization wavelengths like shortwave radio and things like that. So to do this, we have to go far away. Our, that's why 79th parallel, it's way up in northern Canada is where we put our antennas. That's why McGill is uniquely positioned for this because we have a lot of access to these northern, these northern areas where we have our Arctic research stations. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of how our system is set up. We do not have the kind of a GNU radio software defined radio working in this system. This is kind of a tr more traditional radio setup where you've got our large antenna, we've got just the usual filters, amplifiers, a custom kind of, it's called a snap board that's been used in this project. It's also been used by a few projects here at ASU. And then the data is sent out from that into a set of hard drives. Now, this is unique in that it needs to last through the winter. And as you probably know, the winters in the Arctic are not as easy to make things last in as summers in a lot of other places where they do radio astronomy. So unlike a lot of other systems, which would either have some kind of power connection, which is impossible far away, or run off of something like solar, which works great for something, say you're in the Australian outback, that's perfect for solar, maybe with a bit of a backup for nighttime. But for us, we don't have light, we don't have heat, we don't have ability to access any of these things, so they need to last throughout the winter. And the way we handle this is we have a hybrid fuel cell solar, uh, solar panel array, 
And this is set up with my colleague Ian Hendrickson here, who was setting up and helping to set up some of these antennas. And you can see in here, in the bottom right, that that's the, uh, the fuel generator, the fuel cells. And down there is the, the commute, like the front end box, which detects information from the, from the antenna and then stores it to a hard drive array. Now, one of the big things we're aiming for with this project is to keep things off the shelf, keep things open, keep things accessible to others, so that first of all, it's easy for us to scale up this program so we can have more and more antennas as we need them, and also so that it's easy for others to verify and reproduce what we're doing. So we're trying to have a kind of a minimum of this is a $500,000 custom piece. So I'm just going to give you a bit of context as to where exactly these are located and where we work on these. The first place is Uapishka, which is in the interior of Quebec. It's fairly far from civilization, but it's not completely disappeared from civilization. So we can drive up there pretty much all through the year, not, not completely, but it's, it's accessible. So we can set things up for testing, we can run things in a fairly radio quiet area, but we also have up on Axel Heiberg Island, the McGill Arctic Research Station and our actual antennas in a very, very radio quiet place that's not accessible outside of a very narrow window between the er very early summer and midsummer, because Arctic summer is very short, but it's the time we can go up to access it. So we've also got a second antenna that we're working on called the Mapper of the IGM Spin Temperature, MIST, that's again probing the Dark Ages, Cosmic Dawn, and this was designed to verify a previous measurement called the Edges Detection. And one of the things the Edges Detection is that there was some discussion that it could possibly be the antenna backplane, which caused some interference with that detection, and we want to verify if that that signal was true. So to do that, we are now building this new mist antenna, which does not have a backplane. So because of that, and this is where GNU Radio is going to start to come in, we need to know the soil properties very closely. And one way to do that is with soil probes. Those are a little bit difficult and not always consistent. Requires They're kind of destructive a lot of the time. So we are trying to work with ground penetrating radar systems. and. We want to get something that is open and usable for other uh, cosmology experiments, other glaciology experiments, and other experiments where they're working in very rough terrain, and the commercial closed source systems are not really viable alternatives in the way that you would like them to be. Because a lot of these closed source systems are very bulky, they work at one particular type, type of frequency, They're, they run on proprietary software, and most importantly, you'll remember in the Arctic, in the winter, it's a nice kind of snow, well, nice, it's a nice snow, and if you want to do glaciology experiments, you can just slide your GPR over it, it's great, but for us, when we're setting things up, it's not always the winter, it's the summer, and in the summer, it's rocky, it's craggy, things are kind of half melted, there's, there's things that used to be frozen ice kind of cracking. So it's not, even this cart, we have one of these carts that we've attempted and they're not really capable of getting the measurements we want to be able to nicely figure out those soil properties. So we've been working on building our own uh, GPR that we want to mount then on our drones, because we use, drones for antenna characterization. So we basically want to see what the beam pattern looks like. We have a drone that flies around and basically detects how it can interact with the antenna. And we've already got this set up. I'm not sure if the video is going to play on this setup. No, it is not. Well, as you can see, pretend there's a very pretty video of a drone flying around. And it's going to show you the kind of Arctic tundra. You can see how it's very not sturdy. It's not like going to like Death Valley or something. There's a lot of antennas they like to put out in places like Death Valley where it's very flat and easy to just run a ground penetrating radar or lay out a network of soil probes. It's not so simple up in the Arctic. So there are and have been ground penetrating radar drones. We've seen them. Most of them are closed source or use extremely expensive equipment, which is not 
the goal of this project. The goal of this project is to make something that's accessible to people. So say any other group that wants to set up its own ground penetrating radar drones will be able to do this. So we're doing this completely openly. We want to have this completely accessible to people, which is why we're using the, the EDIS platforms that we have, because those are open and easy, easily accessible. And if we publish the code, anyone can grab one of those, replicate our antennas, slap them on their own drones, and they'll be able to replicate what they've got. So this summer, I was working with the pair of undergrads as I was discussing on testing GNU Radio. GNU Radio is new to our group. This is kind of the first summer that we've been playing around with it. We got ourselves a B210. We've been kind of trying to build a initial prototype of just a, a non-drone ground penetrating radar that eventually we're going to be able to put on the drone. There have been groups, as I said, that have done this before. We've adapted. This is, this is just our very basic testing script. This is working with these undergrads this summer on this project. And we're just doing very simple here, just sending out a chirp through the B210, transmitting it, receiving it, and storing it, and then I wrote a little backend that will just do, uh, it will just detect the, the transmit receive and detect using match filters the actual like delay. So here is our setup, and Michael built this wonderful antenna setup here that's all 3D printed, all put together. We got our specific antennas that we've now brought out and tested on real soil in real conditions. And we've gotten some detections. We don't think they're quite ready to show, but we do have kind of a semi-working ground penetrating radar. So what, we've, what we're gonna show here is we've just got some loopback tests that were written by one of our undergrads. And these loopbacks basically are proof of life that the GNU radio thing is working for us. And this is uh, new information for our group. So what we've got here is just initial loopback tests showing on a, a uh, quick, like a terminating loopback, and then a 20, 20 foot cable, and then a 40 foot cable. And we're seeing the expected delay that we expected to see. So this has been kind of the project that we've been working on to get ourselves acquainted with GNU Radio and get ourselves ready to start using this either in our ground penetrating radar or eventually in the back end for future radio telescopes because it's a really nice extensible way of keeping things open while also making things more accessible to new people who are getting involved because previously to get someone up to speed we had to go through a huge amount of manual uh, manual pro components which is difficult for getting people up to speed quickly. So thank you. Um, our next steps are that we're going to get the permittivity and conductivity extraction from our custom data set. We're going to try to miniaturize the system a bit more. Trying to get the B210 onto the drone is a bit iffy. It's definitely possible, though. We've seen some other people who've gotten it on in other contexts. And we're trying to get a full like step frequency continuous way of implementation going that we can definitely say with testing is giving us good ground penetrating radar results up to par with the commercial units. Because right now we've got initial, initial data that's working, but not quite commercial grade yet. And then we're going to field test it, hopefully in the Arctic. So thank you. If anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you for mine. One sec, is Henning already here? There you go. You can already walk up, um, but we'll take a question or two. Sorry, I saw a hand. That's Kevin. <clears throat> what frequency is the is what for the ground penetrating radar? Why? Why? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, for the antennas. The antennas are working around 1.2 megahertz up to about 200. So it's kind of a that that range. And is that like the the red shifted frequency of That's the, the yeah. red shifted frequency that we're looking at cuz we're trying to look at a the, the each antenna looks at a slightly different frequency range but generally that area. All right. Any one we, we can have one more question. I'll I'll take Libby over you, sorry. <laughs> but and Henny you can go up Kevin and, and sit um, and set up. Thanks. Um, how much of the dark ages are you ap actually able to look at? Like, how far back do you get? Because I know at some point the ionosphere starts blocking and you're not able to observe, and that's why, like, far side and stuff is a thing. So, like, what's your redshift expected? 
We're still not fully getting a result from that yet. I don't think I can speak to that very well. I'm more on the, the ground penetrating radio side of this to be okay. able to answer that question. Cool, thanks. Thank you, once more. Thank you one more time, Francis.